Hello and welcome to part four of History Boffin's South Africa playlist, where we'll consider the post mefakane arrival of whites in Bantu-speaking areas and look at the series of land grabs that took place from the 1830s to the 1860s. This was a period when the Vortrekkers settled, consolidated power and came into conflict with Bantu tribes. Partly because of this, and partly due to the actions of British representatives in South Africa, the British government was encouraged or forced to annex particular areas. This was a messy process, and the video simplifies some of the annexations, firstly to focus only on the major trends, and secondly to keep the video to a reasonable length. We can now combine what we learned in parts 2 and 3 of our playlist to understand the dynamics that caused conflict and annexation in South East Africa between the 1830s and 1860s. You'll recall that the British-controlled Cape Colony had grown steadily, but still did not really encroach upon Bantu-speaking lands. Instead, it had continued to develop northwards into land occupied by the Khoisan. An exception was that the British had forced the Hosa tribe to move eastwards in 1820, in order to accommodate several thousand settlers. In fact, this tribe was used to the whites, having seen Trek Boers move into its land for some time. However, the 1820 eviction marked a more serious incursion by whites, and relations between the tribe and the invaders tended to be difficult. In fact, there were three serious Hosa uprisings, in 1834, 1846 and 1850. Each time the British responded by destroying cattle and crops and thereby forcing surrender. However, what truly hammered the Hosa was a lethal cattle disease, bovine pleuronomonia, that ravaged the wealth of the Hosa. In response to the new threat, many of the tribe followed a 16-year-old female who claimed to be a prophet and who urged the killing of cattle and the destruction of crops to somehow renew tribal strength. By the late 1850s, the Hosa had destroyed as many as 400,000 cattle and 40,000 of the tribe had died of starvation. They no longer represented serious opposition to the British, who absorbed their territories in 1866. Several other tribal lands in the region, such as that belonging to the Tembu, were to be annexed by the British over the next two decades. As we learned in the last video, the hegemon amongst Bantu-speaking tribes was the Zulu Empire, which had played a pivotal role in the Mafakane. Around it, other tribes had relocated and readjusted to the Mafakane, with some joining the Hosa and others moving into Griqua and Cape Colony lands, where they slowly assimilated into white-dominated society as slaves or servants. Of course, the British were slowly eradicating slavery in Cape Colony, as it was throughout its empire, but the Afrikaners were less inclined to abolish this practice. This was one of the reasons why the Voortrekkers set off for new land in the mid-1830s. The Voortrekkers, to simplify their route, moved northeast and out of Cape Colony. There, they found land that, if we accept the traditional view of the Mafakane, appeared deserted. Revisionists might claim this was the narrative created by Afrikaners to justify their land grab. In any case, Significant numbers of Afrikaners settled between the Vaal and Orange rivers, and after initial conflict with the Ndebele, who had split from the Zulus and moved northwest from Zulu land, the Afrikaners drove this tribe northwards and were in the early stages of creating a coherent community. However, differences of opinion amongst eminent Vortrekkers now led to a split, leading some Afrikaners to move to Port Natal, modern day Durban. In doing so, they had to secure land grants from the Zulu chief, Shaka's brother and murderer, Dingane. After initially granting land to the Afrikaners on condition that they reclaim cattle for him from a neighbouring tribe, Dingane had a major change of heart, and during the ceremony he killed the Afrikaner negotiators, then attacked a Vortrekker lager, a circle of wagons, killing dozens of men, women and children. The Afrikaners responded decisively, and sent 500 armed Afrikaner commandos in 57 wagons deep into Zulu territory. Forming a lager next to the Nakome River, they were attacked by perhaps 10,000 Zulus. The Battle of Blood River, as it has gone down in Afrikaner folklore, saw about 3,000 Zulus killed 
and not a single Afrikaner fatality. The primary reason was technology. Every Afrikaner was armed and the group also possessed two small cannon. This was a taste of things to come for the Zulu, as we will find out. The Zulu Empire was then racked by internal conflict and the emergence of a new chief, Mapande, and the death of Dingane saw more cordial relations between whites and Zulu. In the next few years, about 6,000 Afrikaners settled in the area and the Natal Republic was formed. However, this situation did not last long. With the Zulus now subdued, Bantu-speaking people who had fled the area, now known as the Natal Republic, during the Mafakane, returned. This increased tension between the whites and blacks. The Afrikaners regularly abducted black women and children to work for them, and eventually the nearby Mapondo chief requested British protection. Imperial politics now came into play. The British government was not overly keen to take over more land, but they worried that if they did not secure the land to the east of Cape Colony, another European power might move in. Therefore, in 1842, a small British military force moved into Port Natal and took control of the region. The Natal Republic became the British colony of Natal, and almost all of the Afrikaners who had settled there now moved back to the central highlands to settle with their kin. They found the Highveld, as it was known, in turmoil. The largest tribe in the region was the Basutu, ruled for some time by Mashuishu. He had resisted Zulu aggression during the Mafakane and certainly was not going to allow white settlement on his land without a fight. As in Natal, other Bantu-speaking tribes had trickled back to their tribal land now the Mafakane was truly in the past, and Mashuishu claimed suzerainty over them all. The Afrikaners, meanwhile, did not represent a strong, coherent group. Finally, the Greek was the mixed group of Cape Coloured and Whites, who had been really the first group to settle in this area other than Bantu, claimed control of some of the region. Once again, the British tried to take control, but this was no government policy, but instead the actions of a few arrogant and ignorant Cape Colonial governors, intent on securing the northeast borders of Cape Colony. Several treaties gradually increased British influence, but the most significant action was in 1848 when Sir Harry Smith, Governor of Cape Colony, announced that Britain would assume control of the region between the Orange and Vaal rivers to protect both whites and Bantu tribes. The new British administrator of the region decided to force Machoishoi to accept British changes to tribal boundaries, but in 1851, a small force of emigrants, native Africans and a few British soldiers suffered a humiliating defeat. The British now decided to leave the territory and leave administration to the white Afrikaners. In 1852, independence was granted to Boers north of the Vaal River, thus creating the South African Republic. In 1854, another treaty saw the Orange Free State created. These two Boer republics were to remain significant states in southern Africa up until 1910. The 1850s and early 1860s saw significant consolidation of the recently gained lands. In British Natal, thousands of Indians were imported to provide cheap labour, which hugely influenced modern South Africa. Hundreds of thousands of ethnic Indians live in South Africa today, the vast majority having been born there. And during the segregation and apartheid era, Indians were allies of black South Africans, suffering much of the discrimination the blacks did, though not to the same degree. The South African Republic grew larger through absorbing two other sparsely populated Boer entities in 1858, though internal disputes meant it took some time to assume effective control of these outlying lands. Meanwhile, the Orange Free State steadily built the apparatus of a state, and in 1861 annexed Adam Cox land, a significant Greek estate. However, there was one final act of British imperialism which was to have a long-lasting impact. Conflict between the Orange Free State and Mashoishoi's Basutu had been ongoing for years, and while each side had periods of advantage, by the 1860s Mashoishoi was pleading to the British to assume a protectorate over his tribe, 
assuming that this was the lesser of two evils. In 1868, the British annexed the land as the British colony of Basutu land. Much of the tribe's best land was not granted to them, which caused great resentment, but the ailing Mshoishoi, who died in 1870, could not resist the move. Mshoishoi had witnessed immense change in southern Africa during his reign of almost 50 years. He had met Trek Boers and witnessed a Mafakane. He had seen whites settle in and around his land and experienced the growth of British and Boer states. The situation in southern Africa when Mshoishoi died was complex. Bantu-speaking tribes were still a threat to the emerging white colonies and republics, and friction between the British and Boers was common. However, the land was still regarded as of little worth, and this prevented greater conflict. This was to change, as we shall find out in the next video. We have covered an exceptionally complex process in this video. However, you don't need to know everything that happened, and please remember that there is no mark scheme that requires encyclopedic knowledge of events. Your job as a historian is to remember one or two examples and use them to illustrate the point you are making. In this sense, you will never be asked to write a story in your essays, but instead you will be asked to analyse and evaluate causation and consequence, or significance. In the case of this video, we can see cause and effect in the actions of the British government, who often responded reluctantly to events on the ground. We can predominantly see actions by whites and consequences for blacks. We can highlight the significance of these events by acknowledging the creation of two independent Boer states who did not have to adhere to British laws or policy. The key detail is included in the grey boxes that have appeared throughout the video. Everything else is additional, useful and informative, but not anything you should be expected to commit to memory. As you develop as a historian, you will make better judgments about what level of detail is enough to understand a topic. As ever, thanks for watching and please subscribe by pressing the red subscribe button below. You'll easily be able to find new videos to help you with your studies, but you may wish to watch the video simply to learn more about history.